Now we find in chapter 49, Then Jacob called his sons and said, Gather round so I can tell you what will happen to you in the days to come. Have any of you ever been to a bedside of someone that's passing? They're going to leave, and they have these kind of like, I don't mean to make it Hollywood-esque, but there's these moments at the last words that they speak to you are to be kind of memorable. It may be a rebuke. It may be encouragement. It may be something that they need to charge you with to grow into as they see things in your life. And Joseph is among them. He's been there in Egypt. And he's, as we talked about last week, was brought to his father and his two kids would inherit a portion, uh, as would all of his sons. And as we look at this passage of Scripture, I want you to zero in on this word because this is really interesting. Gather around so I can tell you what will happen in the days to come. Uh, my father passed away, and uh, I was by his bedside, and uh, it was tough letting go. And he died of a dreadful disease. Uh, he died with ALS, or Lou Gehrig's disease, it's commonly called. And uh, he, he had a, a lot of pride. He was down in Florida, and he wanted to come back to Illinois because he didn't want to die and have us have to transport his body from Florida where they wintered. And uh, it kind of kind of neat because God honored that, and he was home. And uh, I can remember my daughter Misty was small. It was the same year, I believe, that we came here, 92. Was, Mom, was it 91 or 2 that Dad went? Okay. And it was the same year, I believe. So um, my dad, I was out of ministry at the time between churches, and he knew I was candidating here and candidating in Marion, Indiana. And so uh, he, didn't, he passed before... I actually accepted the church, but he was really interested that I be in the ministry, and he kept talking to me about that in his last days. And so those were kind of impactful words and impacted me in such a way that I wanted him to be able to see and celebrate with me as my mom is with us today and celebrating a little bit uh, with us. Uh, I wanted him to be able to see the fulfillment of his desire, and he was taken before I accepted the church and moved here. So it was kind of tough on me because I knew he had a desire and it was yet uh, something he longed for, for me. And uh, so he, um, he, he checked out before I moved here, took the church. And so uh, it was kind of tough on me. And uh, I know he's really in a, in a much better place than I am today. And uh, sometimes I want to go to be with him and see Jesus. And you probably share the same thing, don't you? But there is something significant about someone's last words, and there is more significance in this context because he's going to prophesy and forecast through God's Spirit. He's going to foretell what's going to happen in each one of their lives. And some of them, you know, I, I don't know about you, but I a little bit get weary of um, people prophesying freely, uh, like they've got a prophecy for everything, because usually those kind of people, when they prophesy, it's always good. It's like the fortune cookie that opens up, and you will prosper as you, you know, and you will do this, and you will overcome this problem in your life, and so it's like, it's always usually good. It's like, you're going to die today at three o'clock. It's never those kind of Forecast, you know what I'm saying? And so it, the, the, the restaurant wants you to come back. They want you to have a good taste in your mouth as you eat the fortune cookie. And so it's kind of like when God speaks, there are times that he speaks in forecasting judgment and rebuke, and sometimes he's forecasting blessing. And as we look at this prophecy that he's going to speak over each son, we're going to see that there's something moving him, and it's beyond him. It's the Spirit of God. Part of it is 
starting with him knowing his kids. And I know my daughter, and I know my, my niece and nephew, and I know things about them, and I can sort of forecast because I know who they are and how they navigate their way through life, and I can make predictions and be okay with some of those. But, but when God shows up and you're inspired by him to forecast, then it's quite different. And I think of this because... I realize that God wants to plant something in your mind of the future and how you are to have your attitude and your mind focused and moving towards what he's forecasted. For instance, the stack deck, the, you know, the, the, um, the spider web, all of those things are kind of weird to me in a sense that when they happened, uh, it was very moving and it was very futuristic, and I don't believe we've even touched the, 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 the tip of the iceberg in a sense of what that is going to involve and entail. But I have since learned that as Paul writes to Timothy in chapter 1, verse 18, he says, fight the fight according to the prophecies previously made concerning you. In other words, sometimes the reason that God speaks ahead of time and plants something in your mind. It's to accept his will, to plan according to his will, so that when it happens, you allow it and you flow into it. And some of it is to give you hope when you're really down. And that when God speaks prophetically to us, and I believe that he does from time to time, when he speaks prophetically to us, it's to give us hope because that Word of prophecy of good things yet to come will be tested and it will seem impossible for that to happen. And you have to believe in spite of the obstacles and the things that are happening contrary to that. And that's why God gives you forecast for your life from time to time. Now, not every believer has had this uh, and not every believer probably will, but oftentimes there are words that God would like to speak, and sometimes God speaks to me, but I don't recognize it, and he has to make it real to me somehow. And he has spoken to me many times prophetically, and I'm around people that are open to that, and so I reap the benefit of that event. And so when we pray on Sunday morning, oftentimes God speaks to us little bits and pieces like that, and he gives us his perspective through analogies and pictures. And so it helps us gird our mind for what's coming down the pike that we need to prepare ourselves for, and that's why God does that. Now, you know that we are following a God who knows the begin from the ending. He knows your life. He knows how he made you, and he's very uh, good at shepherding you and preparing you for the future. Now, I will say this, that many people find themselves in the will of God not so much by prophetic utterance, but sometimes God puts a desire in your heart and you get to realize that and you say, wow, this is why I was really made. And those desires, he that, be, you know, he that began the work, he's going to complete something. It's a desire that he put within you to will and to work for his good pleasure. Sometimes God is going to bring me into his will against my own desire, against that. And I have many prejudices or how I think God wants to work and he's thinking bigger and my ways are not your ways and he, he, he leads us into his will sometimes kicking and screaming all the time and that's happened to me much of the time uh, I feel like you know as many as our sons of God are led by the spirit and the word led there is like a horse that has a bridle in its mouth and sometimes you can't get a horse to go over a bridge but you can take it because of the bed in its mouth and you can drag it into the place where you want the horse to go. And sometimes I feel like God is directing me in many different ways. He puts desires there. I get to see those fulfilled. He sometimes drags me in, and I didn't want to make it happen that way, but that's how it happened. And now I accept it, and I look back and say, wow, that was neat. <laughs> I'm glad he was faithful to drag me into his will. But sometimes God, because you don't think like God, he plants something in your mind that he's forecasting for you in the future. And that's why 
Thessalonians tells us to not despise or put out the Spirit's fire. Don't despise prophetic utterance. But examine everything closely, because everybody prophesying isn't to be trusted. Examine everything carefully, hold on to the good, and abstain from the evil. And so you, when you get a word from God, a prophetic utterance of something he's forecasting for you in the future, and it comes through a prophetic utterance like this case here in this chapter, uh, it is to be not despised, but to believe and be received. And as we watch this, we have the advantage being past this time in history when these words were spoken. And we can understand that it, it, if, it, we can study history and say, did that really happen? As he predicted. And you know what? It all came to pass. Because the Bible is such that it was, it was breathed by the Holy Spirit. And so he says, gather around and I'm going to tell you what's going to happen before it happens. Assemble and listen to the sons of Jacob. Listen to your father Israel. Now I think it's interesting that he's referring to himself as Jacob, and he's referring to himself as the name Israel. And God actually changed his name. So it may be that, you know, we looked at these babies today, and they have a name, and maybe just like Saul and Simon was changed to Peter, and Saul was changed to Paul, and we look at how God looks at somebody, knows their future, and he renames them at critical points, and he gives them new names. And with Israel, he said, your name's going to be called Israel, Jacob. So he looks at himself as, this is who I was, and this is when I met God, and this is what I am now after meeting God. God has made the difference for me to live up to this new name. And I like that. Now he says this to Reuben. He says, Reuben, you are my firstborn, my might, the first sign of my strength, excelling in honor, excelling in power. Now, when you were born, you were my firstborn, and it was a sign of my power and my strength, and you as the firstborn had the honor of a double portion of the inheritance. And that's how you were born. But watch this. Turbulent as waters, you will no longer excel. You're going to be like controlling turbulent waters. And if you ever have boiled water, you see, you know, I made oatmeal today and brought the water to a boil. And you, the only way you can control it is turning the heat up or down, and it's the intensity of the boil. But you can't control how the water is going to bubble and where it's going to do it. It's out of your hands. He said, you're like turbulent water. You're like boiling water. You will no longer excel. If you went up onto your, uh, for you went up on your father's bed onto my couch and defiled it. And he went into his wife's concubine and had sex. And so he sees that this is an area that lacked control in his life. He was born in strength. He was born in excellence. He was born in, in power. But because of something he did, he lacked control then, and it would follow him throughout the days of his life. And so we see that this is um, true in chapter 35, verse 22. It, it talks about how he went into his father's concubine, and because of that. Now, I, I suppose that Israel would have known that and could have predicted that, but that's exactly what happened in his life. Now, Simeon and Levi are brothers. Their swords are weapons of violence. Let me not enter their council. Let me not join in their assembly. For they have killed men in anger and have hamstrung oxen as they pleased. Cursed be their anger so fierce and their fury so cruel. I will scatter them in Jacob and disperse them in Israel. And so here are two brothers... And you remember what happened. Their sister was raped, and they went out. And uh, the, the guy, after raping, wanted to marry her. And he says, well, we can't because unless you're circumcised, and if you get circumcised, then you can do, we can intermarry and all this. And in the time that they were circumcised, before they were healed and feeling pain, 
they went in and attacked him because the guys were at a great disadvantage to defend themselves, and they killed him. And they had fierce anger, and their swords were activated. And because of that, he said, I'm going to tell you by the word of the Lord that you're going to, uh, you're going to be uh, scattered in Jacob. And you'll be dispersed in the nation of Israel. And here are uh, a couple of, of uh, Simeon and Levite, because of their action, it caused them to lose property that was marked as this tribe's property. And they were absorbed. Uh, Simeon was absorbed into the tribe of Judah. And it had to share and lose its name in the territory. And it was under Judah's territory. So they were, they were absorbed. Then Levi produced the priests who were not to get property like the other tribes because their portion was the Lord. And they were to live in kind of a parsonage. I used to live in that house. My wife and I used to live there in that house with Misty. And uh, we did not own that, but the church provided that for us. And it's kind of been that way, I guess, probably uh, since the Levites or something. Uh, where housing was provided sometimes for the priest or the pastor or whatever, and they had no property of their own. And so, uh, and so they were kind of, because of what they had done in the past, it's something that God did because of their anger and how they acted out of their violence and how they acted out of their anger. Now, I don't know about you, but I get angry and sometimes a little a sword would be a nice thing, you know. I always wished I had 007's car with the rocket launchers. When there's a Buick or a mommy van, you know. Children on board, be safe, you know. And it's like, nah. <laughs> and I'm glad I don't because if I had the power, and see, this is the thing about God is he has the power, but he's merciful and trusted in his power. He could do anything he wants with us but he's merciful in his power. Are you glad for that? Because he has, he has seen me. He could have pushed the button on me many times, and he has not. And I praise him. We ought to sing a song about that, and I don't know. that We do sing songs like that, but not with the 007 rocket launcher. I just think that there ought to be a song written about that. And then we see in verse 8, Judah, your brothers will praise you. Your hand will be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's sons will bow down to you. You are a lion's cub, O Judah. You return from the prey, my son. Like a lion, he crouches and he lies down. Like lionesses, who dares to rouse him? The scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet. Until he comes, it, uh, to whom it belongs... And obedience of the nation is his. He will tether his donkey to a vine, his colt to the choicest branch. He will wash his garments with wine and his robes in blood of grapes. His eyes will be darker than wine, his teeth whiter than milk. And so we have kind of a choice of God choosing Judah. Now, if if I were God and I'm saying, wow, look at Joseph. He's got all the favor. Give it to him. But that's not what God thought. It's not what God wanted. And honestly, Judah was there when they sold their brother. You know, he, he, he was disappointed when they sold their brother into captivity. And remember, he makes this statement like, see, we're getting paid back for what we've done with our brother, selling him into captivity. And now God is after us and he's going to get us. And he goes back and when he's with his father and his father sends him for food the second time and he says, no, father, he said for us not to come unless we have our younger brother with us. Unless you're willing to let him go, we're going to just stay here and starve with you. He says, but I'll tell you what I'll do. I will take the responsibility for him and I, if he doesn't come back, hold me responsible and you can hold me responsible the rest of my life and you can tell me, I told you so, I told you so, the rest of my life. And in a sense, Judah was not perfect, but he repented. And he got back into the good graces of God and you see that 
God did not do that with Reuben. He did not do that with Simeon and Levi, but he did that with Judah. And Judah, we see him repenting uh, through the end of his days. And because he made a mistake but owned it, and it rearranged his life, God says, I'm choosing you to be head of the rest of your brothers. Your brothers are going to bow down to you. And you are going to have a great inheritance from among other nations. Can I just tell you that Judah was, this was fulfilled with Judah? Can I ask you a question? What great king came through Judah? David. And so the kingdom expanded to its fullest thing with David. And he is seen as one who conquered and he was a warrior. And so we see this about him, that he's like a lion's cub. You don't rouse him. He has power, and he has a force, and he has God on his side. And uh, he said, The scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet. Do you know who Jesus came through? Judah. So Judah was chosen to bring forth David, who took a great portion. And David was promised, David, you want to build me a house, but I want to tell you, I'm going to build you a house, and your house is going to be forever. And through your seed, there's going to be someone on the throne forever. And Jesus came as a fulfillment of that prophecy. He was of the line of David. And as he came and as he he obeyed his father, and he won for our salvation through giving his life on the cross, He was handed a scepter. And the scepter was glorious because it it is spread through all the nations of the world. It's just not set there in Israel. You and I are under his rule and we're under his authority. And today we sing to Jesus and we surrender our lives and we give him control of our lives. And a scepter is here in Muncie, Indiana at this facility. And as you are scattered from this place, you are all under the Lord's control. As you invite him in, he works on behalf of his purpose in your life. It doesn't matter who you're working with. It doesn't matter how hard things are. He's present with you. He doesn't seem to be intimidated by your problems. As a matter of fact, he's over. And he can, and he can intervene. And that's why we pray because he intervenes oftentimes on behalf of his purpose for his children. And then we see Zebulun in verse 13. Zebulun will live by the seashore. Amen. I claim it. Come on. There's one you can claim. My wife wants to claim this. I kind of like the mountains, and she likes the seashore. So there's one for my wife to claim. Zebulun will live by the seashore and become become a haven for ships. His border will extend toward Sidon. And so we see that Zebulun was between the Sea of Galilee and the Mediterranean, and so this prophecy is greatly fulfilled, okay? And then we move into Issachar in verses 14 and 15. Issachar is a raw-boned donkey lying... (laughs) Those of you that have King James are laughing. Issachar is a, is a raw-boned donkey lying between two saddlebags. When he sees how good is his resting place and how pleasant is his land, he will bend his shoulder to burden and submit to forced labor. So um, Issachar is strong, and one commentary was telling me that he's strong but kind of unwilling and lazy. And uh, because he's lazy and he doesn't, resist and fight and stand up for that and there's something that's kind of lost and he becomes a servant to bear other people's loads and I think about that and I think part of our understanding of the kingdom of God is through obedience we take up territory for the kingdom like you want to where do you work where, where, where do you live you want your kingdom, the kingdom of God's rule, to manifest where you live and where you work. And if you don't really push in and claim it, sometimes we don't challenge it. The enemy comes in and takes over, and then we become 
kind of chained to it and we don't really resist and we become somewhat lazy and we see how pleasant the land in this and we're kind of coasting as believers and we're not interested in the souls of people around us so much it's just hey I've got it made it's okay it's cool then we can lose territory that God wants us to take for standing up and praying and insisting that God come and holding fast to God wanting it more than you do where you become somewhat of a leader where God wants to instill his kingdom rule in that area of your life. And if you are not resistant and if you are lazy, then you can bow down and submit to forced labor. It's because you're not taking your stand as a believer. And I find that sometimes churches become lazy, sometimes individuals become lazy. And I just heard this, <laughs> I just heard it this week. Someone was talking about their church at home, where they moved from. And they had, you know, money in the bank. And it was a small church. And they said, well, let's invest this money into reaching out so that the church can grow. But what would we do if we didn't have a surplus? And so they didn't want to do it. And they just kind of sat back on their laurels and say, this is pretty good like it is. And because guess what's going to happen to a church that doesn't want to pray and take new territory? They'll probably lose that territory. And that church will probably shrink. There's something about faith. And I, I don't get this exactly. Because... Um, you know, we're, we're, we're either stupid or something, learning the hard way. The reason we didn't have coffee today is because to make payroll at AWC, we didn't have enough money to buy coffee. Ah, and it freaks me out. It's like, I want my coffee. I must have my coffee. So I found some coffee, and it, it's the remnants of what we had left, and you didn't get it, and I did. And uh, there are advantages to being the pastor, I suppose. I don't take special parking places up front, but I do take coffee. Just so you know, priorities. And so um, we had to make some really drastic changes. We've had to cut staff. And uh, we're trying to adjust to live within our means. And part of the coffee company business is that we could pay people studying for ministry so that they don't go into debt. But if we don't have coffee, we're going to lose accounts and out of business. And so uh, we're struggling at this summer uh, months period. We don't have orders coming in from uh, schools that normally order large portions of coffee. And so it's very difficult for us uh, in the summer. And so today you're paying the price. But I don't understand living by faith because you want to trust God and step out without seeing things you want to trust him and there's part of faith and part of it's like no you've got to make an adjustment and part of the hard times that we're suffering is pushing us to make tough decisions and so we've had to make uh, those tough decisions okay then we have dan in verse uh 18 here uh we see um oh i'm sorry that's not 18 um 16 isn't it yeah dan will provide justice for his people as one of the tribes of Israel. Now, do you know who Samson, as one of the judges, came out of? You said it, Dan. And he saved his nation in many ways. And so justice will come for his people as one of the tribes of Israel. Dan, Dan will be a serpent by the roadside, a viper along the path that bites the horse's heels so that its rider tumbles backwards. I look for deliverance, O Lord. And so we have here uh, Israel needing deliverance and God raising up individual leaders uh, out of, in this case, Samson came out of Dan. And, uh, but he also, as a tribe, led them into idolatry and so uh, not such a good uh, rap for Dan. And so, and then we move down to Gad. And it says that Gad will be attacked by the hand of raiders, but he will attack them at their heels. Asher's food will be 
uh, uh, I'm sorry, that's Asher. Gad actually lived and settled on the east side of Israel, and it was more vulnerable to attacks. And because of that, they had to, um, they were in a vulnerable place, so they had to raise up an army to attack back. And so because of where they lived, they had to form a defense. And that's the, the history of Gad. And then we see Asher. It says, Asher's food will be rich. He will provide delicacies fit for a king. And so uh, I like this one too, and I think this must be Italy or something because they provide good food. And I, I like to watch them. They provide wonderful olives and olive oil and great recipes. Can I get a witness? And I like to watch, uh, especially on the cooking channel, the Italians cook because they do such a wonderful job. Fit for a king, right? And uh, actually, Asher was given the seacoast area north of Mount Carmel. And so they were able to raise food that was really delicacies that were, and, and doesn't it neat? They aren't even settled in the land, and God's telling them where they're going to rest and what strong points they're going to have from where they're living and what the challenges will be from where they're living. You're going to have to be build up a defense because you're going to be attacked easily because you're the outside one. You're going to be attacked first, so you better build up a defense. There's a challenge for you. And God made us. I think about these children we dedicated today. An awesome thing, an awesome task. Each one of them will have challenges, they will have strengths, and they will have weaknesses. And how can we fortify them as parents? How can we train up our children in the light of their strengths and in light of their weaknesses to settle? And I think that God is doing that here through prophetic utterance through uh, Israel. And then Neptali uh, here uh, is, is spoken of. Um, Neptali is a doe set free that bears beautiful fawns. And Neptali uh, is like a deer let loose and, uh, and has an ability to speak and articulate, and that seems to be what happened with this tribe of Neptali. Like, have you ever been, I, I'm a little claustrophobic. I, I don't mean to tell you my weaknesses, but I get a little claustrophobic. And I gotta, that's why I like windows, and that's why we have windows here. I like looking out. I like light, natural light, and I get a little claustrophobic. And if I'm in a tight space, I can't wait to run and get out of there. And that's kind of like a deer that's been pinned up. It's a good runner when it's first let go. It loves its freedom. It loves to run. It's swift to run. And then we see this, uh, this blessing over and this prophecy uh, over uh, Joseph. Joseph is a fruitful vine. A fruitful vine near a spring whose branches climb over the wall. And I think of Joseph. He goes into a foreign land across the wall, across the boundary, and his vine grows over the wall, and it moves into another territory. And he moves and is directed even by God to go into Israel, or from Israel, uh, promised land, into Egypt. So he kind of climbs over the wall, and is, he's like a branch that's spreading and God is with him. It doesn't matter where he is because God is with him. And he's given a dream. And he's given a dream that his brothers and people around the world will come and they will bow down to him. And they do because he is sent by God on a mission. He's going to be set free from being spoiled, a spoiled brat, to grow up by being mistreated at Potiphar's house and in prison. And he's going to learn the hard lessons that he's going to need to rule because life is going to get difficult. He's going to learn to trust God in that difficult time. And that difficult time is not to be despised because that's when God brings something that he's to bear out for the rest of his days in saving the world. Now, I want you to have that kind of attitude about where you are now. God doesn't promise you easy street. He said, life's going to be difficult, but when it is difficult... You're going to press into me, you're going to know me, and you're going to learn some things the hard way. And in those lessons of learning the hard way, I'm going to prepare you to lead. And I'm going to prepare you for what I'm planning ahead of time to use you in. And then he interprets Pharaoh's dreams. And his dreams are, there's seven years of prosperity and seven years of famine, so save up the years of prosperity and delegate it out through the years of famine. 
And so he learned to be an administrator. He learned through his hard times to be good with administration, whether it's in Potiphar's house or in the prison. This was birthed in him, and God was preparing him. So I just wonder, as I look at you today, I wonder, what is it that you're going through that you're despising right now? Praise God, I'm in prison. I'm learning administration. Really? Where are you? Could it be that you're having a hard time, and the reason that you're having a hard time is God is putting something, he's birthing something in you that he's going to later use in a glorious way, just like he did with Joseph. And so Joseph is a fruitful vine. With bitterness, archers attack him. They shot at him with hostility, and his brothers were these archers. They were bitter. Dad likes you best. You've got the multicolored robe and symbol of authority, and we don't like it, and let's see what becomes of your dream now. And he had bitter arrows shot at him. Folks, I don't know, but have you ever met somebody that just gets mistreated and mistreated and mistreated, and they get bitter and hard and angry, and they're always complaining and grumbling? Or have you ever seen somebody that has had misfortune and misfortune and misfortune but they resist getting bitter. And in that bitterness, in that bitter things happening to them, they refuse the bitterness. And those arrows that the enemy is using to make you bitter is actually a tool that becomes something that God's going to use in your life because you're not bitter. Folks, I've seen it with death, losing a child, losing a loved one. It either makes you bitter or brings you closer to God. Bitterness is an attack that you will harbor this bitterness when bitter things happen to you, or you will look to God, and this is what we're going to find at the end of the book. He said, you meant this for harm for me, but God meant it for my good. He looks back on his life, and he's not full of bitterness. He sees it as God's tool to prepare him for something great that God wanted to do in the world. So really, you can't control what happens to you, but you can only control your response, your response to bad things that happen. You can't control the bad thing often, but you can control your response. And so with bitter archers attack him, but his bow remained steady, his strong arm stayed limber, Because the hand of the Almighty, one of Jacob, God was with me. You meant it for harm, but God meant it for your good to send me ahead to prepare for you. Because the shepherd of the rock of Israel, because of Jesus leading you, because of the good plan of God, God takes what could become bitterness in your life because he's your shepherd and he turns it around for good. And you begin to realize that you're really, all that's happening to you in life is being controlled by one, and God is with you no matter what. No matter what you're going through, it seems sometimes more than you can bear, but God is with you. The strong one from Israel is with you. And because of your Father's God who helps you, because of the Almighty who blesses you, with blessings of the heavens above, blessings of the deep that lie below, blessings of the breast and womb. Your father's blessings are greater than the blessings of the ancient mountains. Folks, there's stuff that you can't buy that God can give you if you respond and not become bitter. But if you respond in your trust to God, he can plant something that's more valuable than the ancient mountains around you, than the boundary of the age-old hills. Let all these rest on the head of Joseph and on the bow of the prince among his brothers. Benjamin is a ravenous wolf. Oh boy, how would that be? Benjamin, you're a wolf. (laughs) And I think that this is where they got in the 70s. Does anybody, I'm old, I know. Does anybody remember the 70s? What, What strikes you about the 70s on radio? Hey, it's Wolfman Jack telling you where it's at. Does anybody remember Wolfman Jack? 
And I, I think, wow, what a cool name. Well, not so cool. <laughs> you are a ravenous wolf, dude. And I, I'm paraphrasing. It says, in the morning, he devours his prey. In the evening, he divides the plunder. And Benjamin's descendants are Saul. And Saul is a warrior. And he's like a ravenous wolf. And Paul is from the tribe of Benjamin. And he divides the spoils. And I think that's interesting because we see Paul coming. And he's a Benjamite. And he's a Pharisee. And he's all for Judaism. And he's even persecuting the church, the sect of Jews that's claiming Christ. And he's, he's, he's trying to reap havoc on them. And then suddenly he has this conversion on the road to Damascus where Jesus comes to him and says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me, you ravenous wolf? I'm paraphrasing. And he says, who are you, Lord? I, I am Jesus whom you're persecuting. I feel it when you do this to my kids. And he was knocked down from his horse blinded by the light. He hears the voice. Those with him heard the sound but didn't understand it. He says, go into Damascus and I will tell you what you're to do. And what is the prophecy that God gave to Ananias about, I want you to go to Straight Street, stand with a tanner, and I want you to go inquire about a man named Saul. And what's he doing? He's praying. And I want you to go lay hands on him and recover his sight. And I want you to pray for him to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And he says, I've heard of this man. He's, he's really a ravenous wolf. And the Lord says, yeah, I know. But I'm going to show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. And I'm going to make him a witness to the Jews and the Gentiles. So when it comes to dividing, I see Paul as the apostle to the Gentiles. Every time he tries to go back to Jerusalem, he says, get out of here, Paul. They're not going to receive your witness. Go to the Gentiles. I'm sending you far away to rulers and the Gentiles. And we see that God divided up. Uh, in, the, you know, he, in the evening, he divides the plunder. In the evening is the end of this line. It's going to have something that's going to divide up and the kingdom is going to, to go to the Jew first and then to the Gentile. And the Gentiles are going to receive it. And I just think that that's awesome, don't you? And all these 12 tribes of Israel, and this is what their father said to them when he blessed them, giving each the blessing appropriate to him. Now, can I just tell you this? And, and, and maybe I, I just need to close and get into the next chapter next week. But can I just tell you this, that... that uh, it seems like God is not very fair. Is anybody, I, I, anybody agree with that? That God isn't very fair? He like blesses one, chooses one, Esau I love, you know, or Jacob I loved, Esau I hated. Well, that's not fair. And you look at this, and you look at the parable of the talents, and it seems that some are given more than others. And it doesn't always seem fair. God doesn't dell out fairly. It's like, you know, we used to listen to Dr. James Dobson when it came to, of course, we only had one kid. But when there was good sweets that Judy made, you know, I wanted it and Misty wanted it. So if she cut it, then I got the first choice. If I cut it, then she got the first choice. It's like, okay, be fair. And that's some of the fairest things you can do, right? But really, when you're following God, he doesn't treat everybody the same. And I, I know that you don't like that, and I don't like that. But that's the way it is, and that's the way he is. And so I just want you to worship God, even though you don't understand why he's doing it, why he blesses some more than others with talents and abilities and gifts. And, but with a gift, there is an expectancy to use that and a responsibility with the blessing. And that's why the Lord says, don't let many of you become teachers, knowing that teachers incur a stricter judgment. So God is, a, is it seems to be unfair in the sense of not dealing out evenly, but judgment isn't as fair either because some incur stricter judgment. But God is who he is, and this is how he saw the 12 sons of Jacob, of Israel. And this is how he spoke.
forecasting what they would be and what they would become and where they would be and what their function would be. And we look at this and we think, how genius is God that he sees things ahead of time and he fulfills it. So I'm going to close there and ask the worship team to come up and I'd like to just pray for you in closing here. And I kind of want to prepare you, if we get to do this next week, Eldon and Louise remind me. I'd like to do communion because this is what we do in communion. When you partake of the bread and the cup, we often want to lay hands and speak a blessing over you. And sometimes it becomes prophetic if God's spirit moves. And I want to just prepare you for that event if we so get to do that next week. And I'd really like to. Uh, and so if that gets to be the case, would you just ask God to prepare you to receive what he wants to give you uh, as you come next week? Would you do that? Lord, we thank you for each one that is here that's been bought by your blood, that you picked us, you chose us, you died for us, you invested in us. And we would invite you to come and make yourself known to us like you did these 12 sons that we would accept our lot in life and not become embittered, but prepared for what you have before us. In Jesus' name, amen. Shall we stand as we sing the closing song?
I was just thinking as we were singing that I will adore you. No matter what your lot is, no matter how you've been dealt opportunities and talents and gifts, there's something that happens when you adore him. You accept him and his work instead of resist and try to make something out of your life that you want. And when you adore him, it's an acceptance of the talents that you've been dealt. And I bless you with the knowledge of who he is, that you might adore him, that you might embrace what he's given you, that you might adore him and see him as the source. And as you adore him, may he bless you, may he free you, and may he lead you in new paths. And I see someone letting go of something that they want, and it's your desire and it's not his desire, and as you adore him and you let it go, he suddenly gives you something new to do, and it's his design for you. As you let go, he suddenly fills you with something new. And as that happens to you, I bless you, and I, I ask the Lord Jesus to strengthen you as you adore him. And may you be filled with the Holy Spirit, and may you walk in his way, and may you know him, and may you have eternal reward. Amen. God bless you. Come for prayer if you need.